Once again, we want to thank you for tuning in to Crossings, a ministry of Calvary Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Dwight Lapine, and I'll be your host this morning as we get started in teaching you what the Bible says, not only about eternal life, but how to get to know God daily, moment by moment, in a personal way. We trust that this connection would really help you have a peace and a joy as you come to know Him and believe in Him. There are a lot of times when we don't feel like we have anything to offer this world. This world seems to be at peace and in joy. And we come home and we're tired. We're exhausted from the work we've put in. We don't have anything left. Emotionally, we're drained. We may help. Last week, I think I had six messages to pre prepare. And after preparing six messages, devotions or whatever, your brain is just turned into spaghetti. And then it's tough to think at all, period. Then people come into the office and you try to help them with counseling and it's tough to know how to help people. You just get exhausted. And the older I get, the harder it becomes. There was a time when I could come up with a sermon outline in 15 minutes. Now it takes me hours to come up with an outline of what I want to be, be talking about. But the Bible, I think, is very clear that God has given us something to offer people. Light and salt. Every person on this earth who knows Jesus Christ as Savior is salt and light. This world does not necessarily want what we have, but it doesn't mean that we don't have something to offer them. And of course, God has placed us here so that we would increase their appetite, so that we'd give a seasoning to them so they would understand some of the need that they have. I'm going to start off this morning by looking at some of the different uses of salt. Matthew 5.13, If the salt of the earth, but if the salt has, has lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? You don't put salt on salt to salt salt. Salt is not seasoned with salt. Salt seasoned. Salt is not seasoned. And so if a salt loses its seasoning ability, what good is it? This world is made up mostly of salt. It's one of the most central ingredients that God placed into this world. And you understand when God is creating this world, it's not by accident that He does this. God is using every single thing on this earth as an illustration Every single thing on this earth that you see on this earth has been created by God with a mind and an intellect to think that this is something we can use as an illustration so you understand more about God and more about your purpose in life. And God, when He's creating salt, is thinking, what are the characteristics that I want to put in salt so that people can see something in their own life that needs to parallel what salt can do? And I want people to understand this as an illustration, so I'm going to put this on this earth so people can understand something about my word. Later on, when my son comes to this earth, he's going to use this illustration of what salt is like. And he says basically salt has two purposes. The purpose of salt, of course, is to season food. The purpose of salt is to trample underfoot. And in Minnesota, of course, we use salt to trample underfoot. Salt has a great purpose in Minnesota. We use it all the time. We use more salt than probably any state in the Union because we need it to, to combat snow and ice. But salt has two basic purposes, and God placed those purposes in salt when He created salt. Years and years and years before man ever, you, you ever lived, when, when this world was created. The illustrations, of course, that God has placed into salt, I want to share with you. First of all, I want to tell you that salt can be destructive. We want to start with that. Salt can be destructive. Every ocean liner that sails on the ocean sails in salt. And when it's, put, when it, when it's steel, steel has a problem with salt. And so ocean liner vessels have to be coated to be able to withstand the salt of the ocean. Salt can be very destructive. I don't have to tell you that. Not in Minnesota. But when I lived in Florida, it was very interesting. I went and bought a van one time. I bought a van in Florida, and I looked underneath it, and there didn't seem to be a lot of rust. I said, this isn't too bad. I brought it home, and I noticed that there was some rust up on the, the roof. And I would grab the, the rain gutter, and I was able to lift the roof up an inch. It had rusted the roof. The rain gutter had rusted out in that van. Weird. I'd never thought about rust from the rain gutter. 
But in Florida, when you have the breezes coming off the ocean, sometimes the mist and the wind can push that salt and the handrails of anything in Florida along the coast is all rusted. Anything that's steel is all rusted. Concrete gets all deteriorated in Florida because of the mist of the salt. Salt can be very destructive. And you look at Judges 9.45, Abimelech fought against the city all that day and he took the city and slew the people that were there and, 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 and beat down the city and sold it with salt. And I'm sorry about the way it, the verse does because when we switch it sometimes to this computer, it changes it completely with this different font. But um, he beat down the city and sold it with salt. Why? Well, what happens is you can't plant any food. He wants this city never to be rebuilt. People can move into this city, but they can't, build, can't grow any food, any food. He sows this entire fields with salt so that nothing will grow. It's very destructive. Again, we've got a problem again here. I don't know if, uh, if, if Logan, are you around? Can you check and see if we can figure out, is this working again? Okay. Sounds good. Salt can be very destructive. We've got, uh, of course, the problem with Minnesota and Florida. The second thing I want you to understand is salt can be a, a preservative. Now, we understand this quite a bit, but before we re refrigeration, we, people used to use salt a whole lot more than they do now. Of course, salt can eat steel, but also salt can preserve meat. And people used to salt meat to ca cause it to be preserved. And a lot of the things that you talk about, whether it's pickled, it's basically the ingredient that causes something. The preservative in that is salt. But people, Christians, are preservatives. We're placed on this earth to pray for people so that they would be preserved. And an illustration, of course, is Jonah and Nineveh. When you talk about Nineveh, Jonah was able to preach the gospel in Nineveh and pray for that city, and God preserved that city. The same thing is true of Abraham when he was an intercessor before God, and he talked to God about Sodom, and God was able to preserve some of the people in, in Sodom because of Abraham's prayer. The third thing is salt seasons. Now please understand, there's two things. Salt makes you thirsty, and salt makes food so that it's tasty. So it makes us hungry and it makes us thirsty. And we hunger and thirst because of salt. Salt can cause us to be hungry and thirsty. Now I want you to understand when we talk about this. You and I have the ability then, because we are salt, according to this verse in Matthew 5, to either use salt for destruction or for good. For good or for evil. We can use the salt within us to help preserve this world, to help season this world, to help this world to be hungry and thirsting after righteousness, or we can be very destructive. And when this world looks at us, they see that there is some real problems within Christians because Christians are extremely judgmental. Sometimes Christians do not use salt to season and to make thirsty. Sometimes Christians use salt to show that we're better than they are. We get so frustrated with the world because of their sin and we want them to stop their sinning. This world can't stop their sinning. Without Jesus Christ, they have no way to stop sinning. And so we come up to them as becoming very judgmental that we somehow are better than they are. My father-in-law and I used to uh, build concrete slabs and we built many garages. Well, one slab in particular that we built, brand new slab, he, this man called us back in the spring and he says, look at it, how pockmarked it is. All of the, the concrete is flaking on the top. And my father-in-law looked at him and said, let me ask you a question. Did you have a lot of salt on this floor this winter? Did you ever clean it off? And he said, well, no. Because he said there was a lot of sand. And my father-in-law took that sand and he picked it up and was all salty. And he said, that's your problem. He says, you can't have that, that salt on that concrete. It'll eat up that concrete. Anytime you have salt, and most of the salt that we put out on the, the driveways here is not really, really that type of salt because it does eat concrete. Now, what I'm telling you is this. There is no neutral territory. 
either we are going to be used for the right purpose to help people or we're going to be used for the wrong purpose if our gospel be hid. There is no neutral territory here as a Christian. A lot of times people think as Christians, it doesn't matter. As long as I don't talk to people about Christ, as long as I'm a good person, I won't be a hindrance to the gospel of Christ. If I'm not seasoning, it's not going to matter to people because I'm not hindering them. But there is no neutral territory. When you look at Matthew 12, 30, he that is not with me is against me. He that gathers, gathers not with me scatters abroad. It's a fri frightening thought because listen to me carefully when I say that there is no neutral territory when it comes to salt. If we're not gathering, we're scattering. That's what Jesus says here. He that gathers not with me scatters. It's not like I'm not gathering, therefore I'm okay. According to this passage, and I think it's really true, you're not a Swiss, Switzerland type Christian that's neutral. You cannot be neutral as a Christian. If you're not in the warfare, winning people to Christ, then you are scattering people from Christ. I don't think there's any way for you to be a neutral Christian. Another verse that seems to be the opposite side of the coin, Jesus said, forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. Yes, that's true. These people were casting out demons, but they were doing it in Jesus' name. It's not like they were negative Christians. These people were doing it in Christ's name and the disciples forbade them and said, don't do this. And Jesus said, why are you forbidding them? These people are doing it in my name. If they're not against us, they're for us. And again, but I want you to understand, this says the same thing. There's no neutral territory here. You don't stand still in the Christian life. If you're growing, that's wonderful. But if you're not growing, you are declining and you are backsliding. What happens in your Christian life, if you're not gathering, you are scattering. What happens in the Christian life, if you are not living for Christ, it means you're against Him. Now that is really hard to comprehend. And the people in the church will look at that and say, I don't... Can that really be true? Is it really true? But I really see in the Bible that there is no standing still in the Christian life. And the problem is this. There's either or here. It's, it can't be both. Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Yes or no? Okay. If you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, what are you filled with? I mean, if you are not filled with the Holy Spirit, what's going to be taking place in your life? If the Holy Spirit is filling you, what's, going to be like, what's your life going to be like? What's going to be taking place in your life? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. The Bible says God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. If the Holy Spirit's controlling you, what are you going to be like? If the Holy Spirit's not controlling you, what is your life going to be like? Is it going to be neutral? Are you going to be a good testimony? Are you going to have love, joy, peace? The problem with this, the either or problem is, if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, the works of the flesh will be made manifest. You will be having a hard time forgiving someone. There will be bitterness coming into your life. You will have a problem with your brother or sister. You will have a problem with someone in your church. You will have a problem with your husband or wife. Those things will take place because love, joy, peace is not there. And the works of the flesh will take place in your life. There's no either or. There's no, there's no level neutral area here. It's either positive or negative. The second thing I want to share with you again is the importance of light. And again, we're looking at Matthew chapter 5 again. I want you to read this again with me. It says, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle to put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it gives light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works. And if you wanted to say it, that they may see. 
We want men to see. We want them to see your works because they're wrought by God. We want them to see God. We want people to see. And the reason they can't see is because there's darkness around them. There are a few things I want to start off with, and I know you know these things, but real quickly, just by way of, of uh, getting some background to this, this particular part of this verse, God is light. 1 John 1, 5 says, This then is the message which we have heard of Him and declare unto you, that God is light and Him is no darkness at all. Okay, God is light. We understand that. There's no darkness in, in God at all. You go back eternity past, there was no darkness. You go in eternity past, since God is light and God is omnipresent, light was everywhere. Now, what God does then when He creates this world it is very interesting because God has to create darkness. In this verse it says, I form the light. He does not create the light. He cannot create the light. He forms it, but He creates darkness. I create darkness because there was no darkness before. So God is creating darkness. Now, what's the purpose of God creating darkness? The purpose for that is so that God can cause focus. If light is everywhere, there is no focus. And so God takes and He puts a focus point on the earth and has the stars focus their light on the earth and has the sun focus its energy on the earth and He has the earth revolve and rotate so that the rotation causes there to be a shadow. There was no darkness prior to that, but when God creates this world, what He does on the very first day, He creates darkness. He has to. There's no darkness of, unless God creates it. And all God does in that is He caused light to be directional. He causes light to create shadows which did not occur beforehand because in God there's no shadow of turning. There is no darkness in God. He says, Jesus said to them again, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. In Him was life. The life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness. The darkness could not overtake it or overcome it. That's what the word comprehendeth means. It could not overcome or overtake the, the light. Please understand that, that you cannot put darkness in a world, in a, in a room, and cause it to overcome the light. Light always overcomes darkness. Darkness never overcomes light. Darkness cannot overtake light. Light can overtake darkness. Jesus was the light of the world. That's the second principle. When He was in this world, He became the light of this world. He came to this world to be the light of the world. It's one of the reasons He came here. But the story of Christmas was that, God, that Jesus Christ was God's revelation of light. He was born in darkness. He died in darkness. He was born in darkness. He died in darkness. But He came to this earth to be the light of this world. Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. He says, I am the light of the world. You walk while you have this light, because there's going to be a com time coming when the light will no longer be, will be with you. Now, in the verse that you're looking at in front of you again, in Matthew chapter 5, it says, it says in, in verse 14, Ye, plural, are the light singular of the world. God has made us to be the lights of this world. Ye, plural, are the light singular of this world. Again, what I'm telling you about that is there's not a bunch of lights that are shining in different directions. There's only one light. There are many light holders, but there's only one light. We're not preaching ourselves. We're not talking about us. We're not talking about our goodness. We're preaching one light. We have the same focus of everyone else in this room has the same focus. The purpose of a light singular is because it's focused. And the church comes together to be a focal point. Even though there are many people in the church, we have one purpose, one focus. And God's standard then is still, His command has not changed, let there be light. I want you to look at this, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. God commanded the light to shine. Listen to this. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light singular of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Okay, now, what is this? God is the light. 
Jesus Christ became the light of the world. Then he says, you are the light. You, plural, are the light of this world. And then he says this, God commanded the light to shine out of darkness. So what's taking place here is a can, the cam- command, the very first command, let there be light. The very same command that he gave in the very beginning in Genesis chapter 1 is the same command he's giving right now, let your light so shine. God commanded the light to shine. So the whole idea here is there's focal point here within this church. God has presented us to be the light holders. And then God has said to these light holders, I want the light to shine. Did you understand that? Do I understand that? Do I know what he says when he says, I want the light to shine? I'm commanding you to let your light shine. I want the light to shine out of darkness. And of course, in the context of this is, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. I want the light to shine. I want you to share, share with you some of light's characteristics, some of the things that cause us to become what God wants us to be. The first thing I want you to understand is light makes manifest. Ephesians 5, 13, but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. If we're not manifesting, then we're not light. If we're not revealing, then we're not light. We've got the job, God has given us the job to manifest or to reveal. We are to reveal, unfortunately, we reveal sin to this world, and the world does not like that, but it is our job to reveal sin. Because we do make manifest, whatever is not reproved and make manifest. The second characteristic is that God wants the light to give guidance. Psalm 119, 105, that word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. The world has two problems. They don't see their sin because we're not reproving, we're not making manifest, and they don't see the Savior. Now, again, let me explain this to you. When I was saved, I was not shown at 12 years of age how rotten of a sinner I was. That's not how I came to know Christ. My grandma told me about how great heaven was, not how bad hell was. And so when she told me about heaven and that I could not go to heaven unless I received Jesus Christ as Savior, I wanted to go there. I want you to picture driving down Interstate 35. You're going south. And you get off at this complicated intersection to get some gas and get a bite to eat. And the intersection has a bunch of twists and turns. And you get off on this interchange and you get to the gas station. You get something to eat. And you get back on the, on the road. Only problem is you're going north instead of south. And you want to go south, but you're going north. Now, understand there are two things that can cause you to realize that you have a problem here. You can see a sign in your rearview mirror that says Albuquerque that way. You can see a sign behind you that talks about 20 miles to Des Moines. That can show you that you're going in the wrong direction if you see the right direction. Or you can see a sign that says Interstate 35 North. And it can say, you are going in the wrong direction. Either one works. Either you can see the right direction or you can see the wrong direction. Each one works. And of course, the world, some people, there's a difference. Some people need to see their sin in order to see that they're going in the wrong direction. Some people just need to see what the right direction is, and they go in that direction. Either one works. But God has given us light for two purposes. Light can reprove, light can make manifest, but also light can show the light of God's glory and can show the right direction. There are two different directions here. You can be saved by desiring heaven or you can be saved by despising hell. Either one works. Let's go back to this problem here then. Matthew chapter 5. You are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. Men do not put light under a bushel. Candles are not designed to be put under anything. Candles are designed to be put on top of things. 
The higher the better. Because if you put it high, you cause it to light the whole room. And so what he's saying, a city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. You put the light on top of a hill, you cannot hide that light. People can see it for miles around. And God is saying, all I want you to do is lift the light up so people can see it. You do not have to manufacture light. All I want you to do is lift it up so people can see it. Let your light shine. You already have light. We're looking at it and saying, what do I have to offer this world? You are light. You are salt. The problem is you can be used for destruction or you can be used for seasoning. Light, unfortunately, can be just as destructive. A candle can be just as destructive as salt. If it's put under anything, it can become very, very destructive, right? It's the same thing with the salt. All God wants you to do is get it out from underneath that and put it up on top of that so people can see it. They need to see it. You might be able to reprove them of sin. You might be able to show the glory of Christ. But the passage says that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now I'm out of time, but I want to share two things real quickly. It is not enough for you to have good works. If you have good works and people look at you and say, oh, look how good of a person he is. Who gets the glory? The passage says two things, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. If you have a testimony that this is why I try to live a good life, because God is the one who empowers me. He gets the good glory, not you. So you need a walk and you need a talk. You have to have both. You have words and a walk. You have a walk and a talk. You have to have both. If you're going to be a light, if you're going to be salt, it's not enough to live a good life. You have to point them in the right direction. They have to be able to see that your good works come from your Father in heaven. That He gets the glory, not you. But friends, as a church, as Calvary Baptist Church, once again, I just want to remind you this. The Bible commands, let your light so shine before men. God commanded the light to shine out of the darkness. God says, let there be light. It's one of the most important commandments in the Bible. We want to be neutral. We want to go around and just live a good life so people can know that we're good people. But you can't be neutral. You can't be neutral. If the Holy Spirit is controlling you and filling you, you will be bringing glory to God, not to yourself. You will be sharing what Jesus Christ did on the cross because that's what the Holy Spirit's going to do. He's going to glorify Christ. I want to thank you for tuning into our program. It's been a delight to have you. I trust that you understand a little bit more about what Jesus Christ did for you when he died on the cross. Salvation is not something that you receive because you're born into a family or because you go to church or because you're good. Salvation is a free gift, but that gift has to be received. If you have not received it, we'd like to have you take some time to talk to God and ask Him that He might be your Savior. You understand that you are a sinner, that Jesus Christ died for you, that you can know that you have eternal life by putting your trust in Christ today.